So the battle over Obamacare is heating up this August, and my next guest is leading that charge. Senator Rand Paul out of Kentucky with me now here in studio, and nice to see you. Senator, welcome back to New York City. I'm glad to be here. I want to get your first reaction to the president's comments on Friday afternoon on health care. Roll this so our audience can hear it, and we'll get reaction next. I think the really interesting question is why it is that my friends in the other party have made the idea of preventing these people from getting health care their holy grail, their number one priority, the one unifying principle in the Republican Party at the moment is making sure that 30 million people don't have health care. His argument is quite clear. If you defund Obamacare, you prevent 30 million Americans from getting benefits under this law. What do you say about that? You know, I think the opposite may be true. I think we all want more people to have insurance. What my fear is, is that he's going to make insurance so expensive that people who currently have insurance may lose their insurance. People who currently have their insurance through their employer may well lose their insurance because their employer may say, hmm, I may well pay $2,000 penalty rather than providing $12,000 worth of insurance. He's creating an economic incentive for people to actually drop their insurance for their employees. But then they would go into the government exchanges. They would. So they and would have insurance. Maybe, in maybe not. Some would be subsidized and some wouldn't. Here's the thing. You make thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year and you're working for someone who is not required to provide you insurance. I'm guessing that it may be more expensive than you can afford. Now, we had another delay that's been reported today and it seems like it's happening once a week. What he would argue, the president would, is that every program like this has growing pains. Medicare, Social Security. He used the example of a new car company rolling out a new model. He yeah. talked about an yeah. iPad by, by Apple. Is that a legitimate argument to say, we have to make some fixes and we will along the way? Here's the problem is the way our country works is legislation is written by Congress, passed by your representatives. The president doesn't get to write legislation, and it's illegal and unconstitutional for him to try to change legislation by himself. So if he says to you, oh, you're a political contributor of mine, and I know Obamacare is going to be hard on you, I'm going to give you an exemption, that's illegal. That's not equal protection under the law, and that's what he's been doing for years now. He's given exemption to specific restaurants, to specific unions, to people who have been his contributors, they've gotten exemptions from Obamacare. Now he's giving an employer exemption. Well, he can't do that. That's against the law for him to just write the law out of whole cloth. If you're able to push your argument forward and defund the law, as it stands today, how many Democrats in the Senate would vote for it? Although there's so what, what if that is the case, then what is your option? If you've got zero Democratic senators, the idea stops in the Senate. Here's what would happen. The House is controlled by Republicans and we uh, almost to a person don't believe in funding Obamacare. If we were to defund it in the House, the Senate would pass the funding with it included. And then you'd have a compromise, and the compromise might be a delay. You'd go to conference committee. When the House disagrees with the Senate, you go to a, a conference committee, and that's where a compromise is found. If you don't strive for what you believe in, if you don't try to defund the thing, then there is no compromise, and we just get what the president wants. The Republicans control the House. The Democrats control the Senate. It should be a meeting in between. It shouldn't be my way or the highway, and that's what the president seems to be saying. On Benghazi, you asked this of Hillary Clinton during the hearings back in January, January 23rd here. Is the U.S. involved with any uh, procuring of weapons, transfer of weapons, buying, selling, anyhow transferring weapons to Turkey out of Libya? To Turkey? I, I will have to take that question for the record. That's, I, nobody's ever raised that with me. You're saying you don't know? I do not know. I don't have any information on that. The inference was that weapons were going to Syria by way of Turkey. And now, just today, we have this attorney, Joe DiGenova, who's been working with a lot of people who were in Benghazi the night of the attack, suggesting that 400 surface-to-air missiles have gone missing and are likely in the hands of al-Qaeda operatives. If that is the case, that is a big deal that the administration has to handle. What do you know of it? You know, I'm concerned about surface-to-air missiles obviously being in the hands of Islamic radicals, but I'm also concerned, was Hillary Clinton telling the truth, or was she simply saying, well, maybe it's classified, maybe I won't tell the truth. I don't think our public officials should come before a committee and not tell the truth. She has said she had no information about this. The New York Times has reported that she was the largest and most vocal advocate of arming the Syrian rebels. 
I find it hard to believe. The New York Times has also reported that the CIA has been involved with procuring arms to the Islamic rebels in Syria for over a year. What was the CIA annex doing there? Why have we had no discussion of that so far? And was she not telling the truth? I don't know. See, the thing is, I think she needs to be deposed again. I think I think uh, Chairman you, you Isa, bring her back. I can't because we don't control any committees. But in the but House, you would like to see her come I, back. I, I have asked specifically to have her brought back, and I hope Chairman Isa will bring her back. She needs to testify under oath. Did she know about this? And did it have anything to do with the misdirection campaign? Mm. And did she have anything to do with not allowing the Marines to go aid their their wounded uh, brothers over there in Bengal. Uh, there are TV documentaries in in the works right now in the life of Hillary Clinton. She's writing a book. There's a series of policy speeches she will roll out in the coming weeks. What do you make of that? I don't know. Maybe she's going to run for president. Would she be a good president? You know, I think her decision-making process with regards to Benghazi should preclude her from holding high office because really it's not so much what happened at the time of the attacks. For six months leading up to the attacks, they asked and they asked and they pleaded for more security. And she says, oh, I never read the cables. The problem with that is, is that that's her job. You know, Libya is one of the most dangerous places on earth. And she's saying, oh, I don't read the cables for the ambassador. I think, I think that's inexcusable. Rand Paul, thank you for your time. South Carolina in June, two trips to Iowa. Would you make a good president? Yes or no? <laughs> I have to leave that to others. And, you know, we're uh, contemplating the idea, but we haven't made any decision. We'll leave it there. Thank you, Senator. Rand thank you. Paul. Let's get a break.